You're listening to episode 95 of the Pastor Writer Podcast, conversations on reading, writing, and the Christian life. I'm your host, Chase Replogle. Well, I'm joined on the podcast today by a well-known author, Philip Yancey. His books have really had a big impact on me, particularly his book on prayer. And also a recently released book entitled Fearfully and Wonderfully. We get into a little bit of the history of the book and also why that book is so meaningful for Philip Yancey. I think this is a really interesting conversation about how Philip approaches his work and how he sees himself fitting into the world of Christian writing. Uh, I found just a ton of benefits to it personally. Also really just intriguing insights from his career of so much prolific writing. I hope you get as much out of this conversation as I did. And as always, thanks for listening. Well, I'm joined on the podcast today by Philip Yancey. Philip worked for 10 years as an editor and then publisher for Campus Life magazine. In 1980, he and his wife Janet moved to downtown Chicago, where he began a career as a freelance writer. In 1992, they moved to the foothills of Colorado, where I believe Philip's calling in from today. There he continued to write and has now written over 30 books, uh, most of them still in print at this point. Three of those books he co-authored with Dr. Paul Brand, which is a topic we're going to get into today, who he has said influenced him more than any other single person. You're no doubt familiar with many of Philip's books, including What's So Amazing About Grace, The Jesus I Never Knew, Where's God When It Hurts, Prayer, and the recently released book Fearfully and Wonderfully, The Marvel of Bearing God's Image. Philip describes himself as a pilgrim, still in recovery from a bad church upbringing, and searching, I love this phrase, for a faith that makes its followers larger and not smaller. Well, Philip, it really is an honor to be able to talk to you today and have you on the podcast. Thanks for joining me. It's my pleasure, Chase. And you're right, I am calling from snowy Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds nice. It's a, I'm in Missouri, and so our, we get snow, but it usually lasts for about 12 hours, and then it's gone, so you don't get to enjoy it for a season. Uh, well, Colorado makes a lot of their economy work because of snow, so we ha- we like it. Well, I love this phrase in this uh, in this biographical information I was reading that one of your aims in writing is to make Christ's followers larger and not smaller, and uh, it resonated deeply with me because one of the things I think about my own writing or writing that I really appreciate, particularly in in Christian literature, is. Um, Writing that doesn't leave the reader feeling like they've they've worked it all out or now have a handle on God or the topic, but writing that sort of takes what we thought we knew and expands those categories and makes not only the world bigger, but God bigger and his grace bigger and and sort of our handle on it maybe maybe less than what we had hoped for. Um, I see that as being true in so much of your writing. Um, I've read several of your books in the past. I found the book on prayer really helpful in when I was preaching through the Lord's Prayer. Um how has writing for you been a way of wrestling with your own faith? And how has writing been one of those tools for making your faith larger, to use your phrase? The church I was raised in seemed to communicate that our whole purpose in life was just to survive, to endure, to get through it, you know, to have a tight, uh, clenched jaw and get to the other side, to Beulah land, <laughs> to the real world out there as if this life didn't really matter. And gradually through people like N.T. Wright and um, Dallas Willard, I realized that, I, no, this life on this earth in, in on this planet at this particular time is, is very important in preparing us for eternity. We, we will spend life in eternity, but what happens here is one of the major determinants of the kind of person we'll be throughout e- eternity. Jesus was quite clear about that. Writing, for me, is the best way f- to grapple with any of these issues because I'm an introvert. I like to kind of uh, look around, go to some people who seem to know more than I do, take their wisdom, study the Bible, study other books, and metabolize it, and, and just come up with a way of coming to terms with things that have been maybe uh, misrepresented to me. That, that's the story of my writing. I did grow up in an unhealthy and a toxic church, and I've had the privilege, through, I consider it a privilege, to look at what that church taught me piece by piece, examine it in the Bible, 
and come up with a different way of seeing some of the same words that I was raised with. I also know you write from a background of journalism. How has that shaped you in the way that you approach these topics? I go to other sources. I think that's one of the main things. Uh, Writing was a way to break out of this narrow little world that I grew up in, in in a very fundamentalist church in the middle of the South, in Atlanta, Georgia. And writing uh, or reading became a window to me. I found my eyes open. I found through people like C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, who were not being read by the people around me, a window to a different way of seeing. And um, then writing became my way of of thinking, I suppose you would say. I could put words on paper. What a reporter does, and I've always identified myself as a journalist, I'm not an expert. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a philosophy professor, a theologian. What a reporter does is take a, di- a difficult topic and somehow make it simple. So, for example, if I were assigned to write an article on black holes or on nuclear power, I have no idea what to write. <laughs> but what a reporter does is find out. So we go to people who can help us. And I have many, many times tackled fields that I knew nothing about. And I'll go to the experts and say, can you explain nuclear fission to me? Can you explain how to ride a, a, a bicycle to me, how to, how to put a computer together, these things that I... I'm not an expert in, but that's what reporters do. We take complex things and try to break them down. And so I've always considered myself a populist. I'm not creating new theology. I'm not creating new ideas. I'm simply taking other people's ideas and uh, particularly the Bible presentation and trying to break it down and present it in a way that the ordinary person in the pew can understand. That's my goal. And in a way, that's what pastors do too, isn't it? You go to seminary, you study, you uh, study commentaries during the week, and you may spend 20 hours preparing a sermon if you've got that leisurely time, but you present it in 20 minutes. And that's what I do as a writer as well. I'll spend hours and hours researching, interviewing, but then you encounter the results in about 20 minutes reading an article of mine. Yeah, one of the things I, I've explored often on the podcast that I continue in my own life to just see so much overlap with is the role of writing within a, a, a pastor's vocation. And as you're sort of alluding to here, these massive overlaps that I think are so critical. Um, on both of those points, uh, one of the things that there's more and more pressure for pastors and for writers these days is this idea of a writer's platform. Um, having something you know truly unique and then having an audience that there that knows you for that. Um, I, you've referred to yourself before as a pilgrim in the pew, which is a great phrase that I think captures kind of what you're describing here. But one of the questions I know listeners are asking that I often wrestle with too is, can a writer still emerge from this platform of the pew? Or could a, can a writer still emerge from a platform of this kind of curiosity versus maybe authoritativeness uh, that you're describing? I think you're more likely to do that now than ever before. When I'm speaking to writers, I say, never in history have you had this opportunity that you can sit down today and write a blog, and tomorrow you will get responses possibly from all over the world, from China, from Malaysia, from different places, because I do this. And um, at the same time, at never time, at no time in history has it been more difficult to make a living as a writer <laughs> because nobody's paying for those words. Nobody's paying for you to write a blog. So you've got tremendous reach, but it's difficult to make a living at it. So a pastor, at least as a, a regular income, presumably. I think of an example like Ann Boskamp. Ann is an ordinary pilgrim in the pew. She's not a trained theologian. And yet, I think she has something like a million people following her on a on a blog. She had a breakout a few years ago with with a book called A Thousand Gifts, and she devotes herself to that blog. I'm sure she spends more time on that in a week than almost anything else. She creates photos, looks up other sources, sometimes involves guests, and 
here she's working from a pig farm in rural Ontario. <laughs> she's a farmer's wife, but she's got an audience that's reaching around the world. And that potential is there for virtually any one of us now. Yeah, I do think that that view of optimism of saying, um, you know, everybody wrestles a little bit with the platform question, but the fact that there's nothing keeping you from writing and doing and saying and speaking and what God's sort of leading you into that some of those barriers, though they may not be the full potential of what you could possibly imagine becoming, that those barriers to the actual work itself are probably lower now than they ever have been before. Yeah, all you need is a computer and a and um, a WordPress. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and the world is at your feet. Right? Yeah, and WordPress is free, and the computers are are better these days than they have been. So, um, yeah. your writing is um, there's a kind of curiosity to it. You're describing in this this vocation of a journalist coming to the work. Um, is uh, hearing you talk just briefly about your upbringing, curiosity does not seem maybe to be one of the values that um, was sort of espoused. Um, where did that curiosity come from for you? Is that something innate or was it something you discovered along the way? I discovered it along the way because I felt a sense of betrayal. I'll take the example of race, for example. I was raised in uh, an environment that, of segregation the Civil Rights Bill was passed just as I was in high school. But up until then, in Atlanta, there was no mixing of the races. So we we went to different restrooms. We sat on different parts of the bus. We um, Black people sat in the balcony of a movie theater. White people sat on the ground floor. It was illegal for a white doctor to treat a black patient or vice versa. I mean, this was Jim Crow. And I lived in the middle of that, and my church was on that side. My church supported that. When when people of color tried to attend our church, they were blocked at the door by a squad of deacons who gave them a, a little card saying, we know you're just troublemakers, you're not true followers of God, you're not welcome here, and turned them away. And when they went further. I don't know if you know this old curse of ham theory that mm -hmm. um, black people were cursed by God because of the the sin of one of Noah's sons, which is, we won't get into that. It's a strange, weird theory, because Ham wasn't cursed at all. It was it was Canaan. But anyway, that's what it was called, and we believed that black people were inferior. I was taught that from the pulpit. Well, then I had a summer fellowship at a place, the Center for Disease Control, uh, this esteemed institution near Atlanta, where um, a lot of the major research on, on medicine is done in this country. And lo and behold, for the summer internship, my supervisor, my boss, was a black man, Dr. Cherry, PhD in microbiology. And suddenly I realized the church had, had lied to me. The church had misrepresented race to me. Dr. Cherry was not an inferior person. Dr. Cherry was uh, an esteemed and knowledgeable and respected person in his field. And if the church lied to me about race, maybe they lied to me about Jesus, about the Bible. And it, it began a quest, which has continued probably throughout my writing career, to pick up one of the things I was taught one by one and look at them and, and kind of dust them off and say, what is the truth here? What can I hold and what do I need to let go? So that was where my curiosity about ideas came from. And I started looking to trustworthy guides who could, um, who, who sometimes would say, we don't know, but this is, this is what we do know. And um, I suppose even as a child, I did have a curiosity about nature, about science, about some of those things. Children tend to do that. But in terms of the kind of writing I've done, it really came out of a a sense that I had been betrayed and truth had been misrepresented to me. So I was curious to find what is the truth that I can stand behind and writing is a way to sort that through and do it. That, uh, that sense of curiosity when you find yourself wanting to know more, wanting to understand a topic better that's behind so many of these books. Um, is there a way you recognize that and recognize okay, this is something I'm willing to give a significant amount of time and reading and energy to exploring. Um, what does that process look like from that sort of first peak of curiosity to identifying, yes, this is a book topic and how you start approaching it? Hmm. Well, I'll give you an example. Um, 
over the years, several times a publisher has talked to me, Philip, you should write a book about and, and filled in the blank. And most of the time I've ignored them. I have enough of my own questions that I want to write about those things. But we had a meeting one time and they said, okay, you've covered some of the basics of the Christian life. But one thing you haven't talked much about is, is prayer. Maybe you should write a book about prayer. And my first response was, what? I, I feel terrible about my life of prayer. I <laughs> Not to mention it's to just a, a daunting topic to consider. So. Right. Plus, I went to a library, and there are whole bookshelves full of books on prayer. So we need another book on prayer. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, if you feel that badly about your own prayer life, maybe you should write a book, because first it'll give you a chance to explore, to, to come up with some... Um, with, with some understanding that can help you, and you're probably not the only one. So the way I started was by taking people out to dinner, just ordinary people, not experts, um, not professionals, but people in my church. My wife and I would take them out to dinner, and, and we're having a good time, and and I said, okay, I'm beginning a book, and I'd like to just ask you about your experience with prayer. Have you? Do you feel good about your prayer life? Well, Nobody said yes. <laughs> Everybody said no. Oh, why is that? Well, I just don't know. It seems like the prayers I care about most don't get answered. And it's boring. You know, after five minutes, I'm tired. And I, I don't know how to make it a fulfilling experience. And I, I went through, I think we took out 50 different couples in the process. I'm still going to the libraries and reading some of the thousands of books on prayer and coming up with some, uh, you know, some principles that will help me. But that's where it started. I usually start with a question that I don't know the answer to. And so the question in that case was, prayer, does it make any difference? And that's the subtitle of the book, um, does it make any difference? And in a different way, I, I, I start with a question in almost all of my books. I go to the libraries, I go to people who can, who've, given great thought, and then sometimes spent their lives um, circling around this one topic. But at the end, it's it, it's my point of view. It's my job of being honest and authentic about the way things are supposed to be and the way things are actually are, and then coming out with some sort of resolution of those two. Yeah, this is another area where, at its best, I just sense one of these deep overlaps with the pastoral vocation. I, I love this image of you in a library with, you know, a thousand books on this topic, some of the best thoughts that, you know, church history has contributed and these interviews with experts. But then at the same time, sitting down with, if I can use the phrase, ordinary people, uh, talking about their own prayer lives over a meal, this sort of connecting of the greatest thoughts we've ever had and the everyday thoughts, the, the sort of life thoughts that people are having, and then the writer sort of standing between those two worlds and trying to pull them closer together. I think that's a really helpful image you sort of paint. Hmm. Well, I'll go back to a person I've already mentioned, C.S. Lewis, because uh, he was very instrumental in informing my faith. And here was this Oxford scholar, both Cambridge and Oxford. He was a professor at one point who was a specialist in, in medieval literature. Um, he read Greek, he read Latin, you know, he, and he spent his, his days in the world of academia. And yet when World War II came along and Britain was being bombed in the Blitz by London, by uh, German bombers every day, and the whole place was afraid and demoralized, the BBC thought, well, maybe we, maybe we could get a, a Christian. Well, they didn't want to get a pastor. That's a little too too religious. So they found this Oxford scholar, C.S. Lewis. And here was this, this brilliant professor who somehow found a way to communicate to the ordinary person. And the book Mere Christianity came out of the series of radio talks that he gave to the entire nation in those dark days. And I think that's what we, uh, we are called to do as pastors, as as writers. So, for example, right now we're living in a very divided time. People are are afraid. People don't know how to handle uh, those who see the world differently. Racial divisions, tribal divisions are coming up again. Christians have a lot to say at a moment like that. And it's important for us to read the times, uh, the fear that's going on, the division, 
and find a way to to be peacemakers, to present hope and um, a redemptive frame that can bring some solace to times like these. Yeah, I think C.S. Lewis is a great image of it. And I think, uh, as I promised, we'll get to Dr. Uh, Paul Brand is as well in, in your work with him. Um, when you evaluate how the church is doing when it comes to its writers, also the church and its reading, um, how do you think we're doing when it comes to producing that kind of writing and, and taking our time with those kinds of thoughts and books? Well, when I look at the bestsellers list in the in Christian literature, I'm, I must say I'm not encouraged. They tend to be more self-help type books. Uh, very me oriented. We live in a very me oriented time, where um, it, the focus is on us. So we're, in a in a sense, books become a verbal selfie. You know, we we find a book that that speaks to uh, that that makes us feel good, or that speaks to some little issue that is important to us. And there's a place for that, but. Uh, there's also a place for getting your eyes off yourself, being aware of other things going on in the world, especially the great work of God going on in many parts of the world. In the United States, we're a media-driven society. We tend to be a very celebrity-oriented society. And uh, international news, international awareness is not at the top of most people's agenda. We're, they're just trying to get through one day. Well, Christians are called to care about those that we don't naturally want to care about, the, the weak, the marginalized, the, the prisoners, you know, those kind of people that Jesus was, was clear, that's part of your mission on earth. And there are, there are some people who are doing that in the Christian world, but they, they don't tend to make the bestseller list. I know that. Uh, when you think about uh, writing, maybe this seems like a, a very simple or odd question. Um, I wonder if I could ask how hard writing is for you. And I ask it because uh, you talk before, I think you have an article on your website, and I've seen you talk before about the idea of uh, the writer as psychotic, which I love. Yeah, right. yeah so I right. wonder maybe if you could describe, um, there's a joy in writing, but the kind of work, the difficulty of it, and why you feel like it's a psychotic process, which I think a lot of writers immediately <laughs> resonate with. Right. Well, let me mention that word psychotic first. The definition is that you enter a reality that is different than everybody else's reality. That's what psychosis is. So in some cases, people hear voices. In some cases, they they have this whole internal world going on. And, and that is a good definition of writing. That's what we do. We create a universe that only we are living in for that period of time. And when I'm thinking about and praying about and spending all day writing about one particular frame, it becomes more real to me than everything else going on. You know, I'll, I'll enter the real world of uh, sleeping and feeding myself, mainly to support my alternate universe that I'm creating. <laughs> so that's why I use that word psychosis. But uh, Chase, I divide it, well, back in the day when I spent mostly, I spent a lot of my time writing articles, I would say, if I wrote a say, a 5,000-word article for Christianity Today, it would tend to break down into five days, two days getting ready to write. And that's the research, which may involve library research. It may involve interviews with people. One day to actually put the words on the paper, and then two days to clean it up. So if you think of a, if you think of a hand, two fingers getting ready to write, one finger actually writing, and two days trying to make it better. And if you blow that up over a whole year, that's where um, that's about how long it takes me to write a book. So 40% of my time getting ready to write the book, and that's the research, the outlining. I very extensively outline each chapter before I write. And then w when I hit that middle day, that's when all the psychosis is. That's when the pain is. When you look at that blank computer screen or blank piece of paper, and you've got to come up with something brand new that nobody thought of before that doesn't repeat what you've already done. That's a terrifying ordeal. And, you know, I get up and walk around. I have to go to the bathroom about every five minutes, mainly, you know, to, to, to avoid writing. <laughs> it's just hard work. And then the last 40%, the cleaning it up, for me, because I started as an editor, is a very relaxing phase because I figure I can I can find a way to make it better. And I probably won't make it any worse. So I just kind of sit there and 
play with the words and try to clarify what I was trying to say and come up with better ways of expressing it. So is it hard? Yeah, it's the hardest thing I do. Most of the difficulty, however, is concentrated in that middle day, the composing day. The other parts, the research is fun, the interviewing is fun, the editing is fun, but that that middle period when I have to come up with words to put on that page, that's just plain hard. It's the hardest thing I do. Is there fear involved in that process for you and specifically around, um, you know, you're writing this whole book, you're handling topics that maybe you're thinking really deeply about for the first time, or at least in a deliberate way. Um, is there fear that you're going to get to the end and have got it wrong or look back on it and realize you drew the wrong conclusion? What, what does that look like for you as a writer? By the time I reach that middle, uh, that middle finger, <laughs> that middle uh, <laughs> composition day, um, I've worked through the fear things. I have, I, I spend enough time researching and, and outlining to have a, a pretty good um, confidence that I can stand behind this. So I, perhaps early on when I first started writing, there was fear. Not so much now. The the forty percent I spend in the in the preparation phase is my way of overcoming that fear. I. I start out with questions I don't know the answer to. There's an element of fear there. But by the time I actually start writing, putting words down, I've worked through that. Yeah, I think that process of reflection creates the kind of courage, the kind of boldness. And uh, I, in much smaller projects, the outlines for me are always, uh, I always know I'm into that next phase whenever the outline is becoming the writing. <laughs> when it's like the outline mm -hmm. are just sentences piling up into paragraphs, like it's time to start writing yeah. this thing. And yeah. you do feel that sort of energy pick up for the work, the conviction sort of building through that process. Right. And actually, I think that's one of the problems today, because we live in this distracted society of of Twitter and Instagram and immediate responses. So, um, you know, sometimes I think um, how much better off we would be if each person would write your tweet and sit on it for a couple of days and then pick it up and look at it again. Yeah. <laughs> President Trump might actually benefit from that process. Well, I've, I've actually said on the podcast, I would love to see a platform that had like a two day delay on posts. You could post it, right. but it wouldn't show up for two days. Cause I see right. this, I see this thing happening too, where when people post something, if somebody then challenges them on it, instead of considering what they said, they like double down on the thought that they actually put no thought into, right? Like we become more defensive of thoughts that we've really taken less time to form because of the nature right. of the platform, which is a, a really terrible thing to think about. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Well, I, I want to make sure we talk about um, the the newest book, Fearfully and Wonderfully, The Marvel of Bearing God's Image. Um, I got a chance to read through the book. Really, really enjoyed it. I, on several levels, I think it's a really powerful book. The content itself, um, you know, the look uh, for anybody who's interested. Well, I think it's for anybody, but particularly through medicine and science and the, the makeup of the human body and the significance of bearing God's image. But it's also a, a, a missions book telling these stories of work with marginalized people in, in around the world. Um, but it also brings your journalism to it where it's, um, it is asking insightful questions in the process. Uh, I want to give you a chance to sort of talk about the book. You've said that you hope this new book introduces a whole new generation of people to the wisdom of Paul Brand. Maybe a good place to start is how you discovered Dr. Brand's work and and why you say he's the person that may have had the biggest impact on you uh, of any of these great minds or readers that you've encountered through your work. Yes, I discovered him quite by accident or providence, depending on your point of view. My wife was working in a, a missions uh, medical supply group that would get uh, donated medicines and equipment and send it to mission hospitals overseas. And she was cleaning out a closet one day and came across a little talk that Dr. Brand had given. I think it was on a 32-page booklet called The Gift of Pain. I happened to be writing my first book, Where is God When It Hurts, at the time. And as I went to libraries, I'm reading books on the curse of pain, the problem of pain, you know, why God allows pain, things like that. And so the, the very title, The Gift of Pain, sparked my interest. 
I read this book, and he had ideas and a perspective on pain unlike anything I had come across before, because he was the one who who discovered and proved that all of the abuse that leprosy patients experience, and we you know we've seen pictures of missing limbs, the missing fingers, the faces are all distorted. All of that comes about because leprosy patients don't feel pain. That's what the disease does. It silences pain cells. And he's, he said in that, uh, in that first talk, thank God for pain. If I had just one gift I could give to my leprosy patients, it would be the gift of pain. Well, I just picked up the phone, brash reporter that I was, and, and said I've never, and, and contacted them. He was living in Louisiana at the time and said, I've never, I've never heard a perspective like this. Could I come interview you? And I did. I flew down to, to New Orleans and drove up to where his leprosarium was. And, and that began um, a relationship because as we got to know each other and trusted each other, um, he said, I tried writing a book one time. I said, well, what happened to it? And he said, well, it was based on a series of chapel talks I gave at a medical college in India. And it was drawing parallels between the human body and the body of Christ. And I they, I was encouraged to write it up, so I did. And at the end, they said, well, it's only about 100 pages, so it's it's too long for a booklet, and it's too short for a book. Well, what happened to it? I said, he said, I, I don't know. It's around here somewhere. And went rummaging around, and in one of his bureau drawers, he found this old... Um, 20-year-old manuscript uh, on India paper, you know, hand-typed, smudged uh, over the years by then. And as I started reading it, I had never, I had never experienced something where uh, a person's life, a person's faith, and a person's scientific expertise all came together. It was a book of analogies on the human body. And as you say, it, it brings together stories unusual exotic stories from his background working with leprosy patients in India, but then applies his uh, point of view as a devout Christian, as a missionary surgeon, who had a great appreciation for the human body and especially for things that we don't normally appreciate. Everything I would bring up as a problem, he would say, well, actually, the things that you're mentioning are all gifts. So vomiting, what a great gift that when we that when we swallow something poisonous, these muscles that are meant to push push food down suddenly reverse and find a way to get it out before it ever reaches your stomach. Well, I never thought about that before. And then, of course, pain being the great example. We None of us like pain. And he says, well, that, that's why it's so effective, because it forces you to pay attention. It's just a language that the body is using to make you pay attention to something that urgently needs your attention. So that perspective, and and more a wise uh, person who had lived in one of the most uh, suffering-filled parts of the world. When you think of people who are really at the bottom of the of the ladder in terms of being marginalized, you'd say leprosy patients in India. Many of them were members of the untouchable caste, as it was called at the time. And yet out of that environment of great suffering and of abuse and marginalization, here was this doctor who had a robust faith, full of humility, full of gratitude. It was almost as if, Chase, that, uh, that God kind of looked at me and said, well, you've experienced some of the worst that the church has to, has to offer. Let me show you some of the best, <laughs> and gave me Dr. Paul Brand. So I was in my 20s at the time. He was in his early 60s, and for 10 years, I spent time writing up his ideas. I, I wouldn't have been capable, really, of writing my own ideas because they were still being formed, but I could write with great integrity about his own faith, and in the very process, my faith did did find a, a firm foundation. Dr. Brand was so instrumental. Um, it's, it was one thing to have experience through, say, a C.S. Lewis, oh, there are people who have wrestled with these uh, these problems, and these helped me. It was quite another to sit with Dr. Brand, whether it was in Louisiana or India or England, and bring up my own questions, bring up my own problems, and, and hear his perspective on them. It was a great formative time for me.
The book definitely captures all of those layers. I think that's the thing that I think is most remarkable about it is you do get this sense of your life and his life and the science, the faith, the the the, the exotic stories, as you put it, but sort of the ordinariness of the human body we all possess. Those layers are just so rich in the book. Um, maybe one of my favorite parts of the book, though, is the the introduction where you sort of just honor Dr. Brand and his impact on you. It, it's just... Um, the way you recount that respect, the honor, it's just, a, for me, a, a really touching introduction to him. Uh, the book itself is actually a combination and sort of an addition from previous work that you've published with him. Why, in your opinion, was this the right time? Why was it important to you? I know Dr. Brand has passed away. Um, to resurface these books um, that, as you sort of have said, a, a new generation needs to discover this work again. Why is, was that resurfacing important to you? The books, well, so the first one, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, had been out more than 35 years. And then I followed up with, with a sequel called In His Image. They were still selling. You, they were still available on Amazon and whatever whatever Christian bookstores are left out there. But uh, things have changed. My goodness, medicine has changed. When I first wrote those books, DNA had recently been discovered. A lot has happened that only verifies some of the things that we were writing about. And the the practice of reading has changed. New generation of readers have sprung up. They're impatient. You know, they're used to being distracted to click from here to there, and and they they tend to be very story oriented. It's difficult to have an idea driven book these days for for a modern flighty audience. So I decided I, I think the material is timeless. The material he came up with, and I I would like to re package it in a way that keeps his legacy alive, that I can uh, present Dr. Brand as someone who can do for others what he had done for me, pass on wisdom and uh, uh, an authentic faith that you can stand behind, but do it in a way that speaks more to modern readers. So this was a fun project to take two books and choose the very best of the two and weave it together in a, in a new structure, new organization, because the material was there. It was just a matter of, of stitching it together in a different pattern. Uh, and I, I, I also think we need, we need different kind of heroes. Younger generation millennials, they have heroes who are musicians, you know, rock musicians or, or athletes. These are the normal heroes. We need a different kind of heroes. And Dr. Brand is, is to be a genuine hero, a person who who spent his life among some of the lowliest people on the entire planet, but yet emerged with a joyful, grateful, humble faith. We need those kinds of models to hold up. Yeah, and, and doing it in oftentimes a kind of un overlooked or forgotten sort of way. I mean, we talked in the beginning about this idea of platform, someone who you might not have said you know, celebrity, and <laughs> giant Instagram following, but yet something so rich and so meaningful and so needed for us to be able to learn from. Yeah, yes. And, and Dr. Brand was a celebrity in his own right. He knew Mother Teresa. He knew Mahatma Gandhi. He had been knighted by the queen. You know, he had that aspect of, of his work being honored, but he turned down the head of orthopedic surgery in, at Stanford University, at Oxford University, to go back to this godforsaken little place in, in India where there was a leprosarium. Nobody wants to live next to one. So it was out in the middle of this uh, desert almost. And, and yet in that desert, uh, an oasis of, of new life formed. It, it eventually became kind of a national park because they developed it with all sorts of trees and plants, botanical plants, and the birds came back. And it became kind of a symbol to me of what he had done in his team with human beings, these people who were beggars by the side of the road that he would bring in, do these surgeries on, and they would become uh, people of faith. Their their whole lives were changed. The book, um, as I was reading it and thinking about our conversation and about writing, um, it struck me at a couple of points, too, that you know what the book does is it takes these sort of broken lives and the commonness, this common human experience of suffering and the way our bodies seem to fail us or seem to, to go wrong. And it sort of does, as you've described it, it sort of puts a new lens to that experience and says, and calls out of it the sort of wonder and 
um, the fearfulness of this body that we've been given, created by God. I wonder if it ever struck you um, parallels in what he was doing to the kind of writing that you were doing, the sort of tacking together bits of <laughs> broken grammar and language and trying to find your end, way into words and then coming away at the end with something that really is fearful and wonderful and, and larger than those sort of single parts. Um, if you ever discovered parallels in what you were trying to do with the work he was trying to do. Wow, that's a new thought to me. Um, it's it's the act of creativity that I think you're talking about, and we don't know we don't know within the mind of God <laughs> how that creative process works. Coming up with the human body and and a combination of design and brilliance and hard work. Uh, that that's a new thought, but I think you're talking about the creative process. Something that that perhaps art reflects the what image art reflects the image of God and what God goes through. There's a wonderful book, very helpful to me on writing by Dorothy Sayers called The Mind of the Maker. And it's a book about God's creative process, God's artwork, the world, the universe. And I I must admit, I have never thought of myself in putting together words in exactly that same way. Um, and I don't care who you are, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, you're only reflecting in small ways the brilliance of the artist that um, is represented by our human body and by the universe. But I think there are parallels. And Pastors who are interested in the craft of writing, I would I would truly recommend that book, which is still in print. Dorothy Sayers, The Mind of the Maker, that explores that parallel very well. Yeah, and she was a great writer in her own abilities, too. So I'm definitely one I'm going to pick up. Um, well, I wonder if we could end this way. Um, we've talked a little bit about prayer. Um, I don't do it on every episode, but sort of as I feel led. Sometimes I'll ask our guests if they might be willing to pray as a way of sort of closing up our conversation. Um I wondered if you'd be willing to do that and maybe pray that, uh, you know, I want to pray that um, that all of us find these kinds of relationships that you found with Dr. Brand, the mm. sort of life-giving relationships that feed our own curiosity and our own our own passions. I mean, I've, I've also been struck that he didn't, your love for the work he was doing didn't inspire you to be a scientist, but it inspired you to, uh, to, to do your work with the same kind of dedication and faithfulness he had so that we might have those kind of rich relationships. And then also that God would lead us as, as writers, as people who are trying to reflect what we're seeing in this world and, and, and bring those questions to clarity for people that, as you sort of say, might be bigger in their faith because of it. Yeah, that's great. Let's do that right now. Thanks. Gracious God, we thank you that you have called us into this process of of breaking things down and presenting them to other people. You you came as the word, and the word is is not threatening, it's life enhancing. It it respects people's freedom. You're not pounding us with you're not overwhelming us with images. In fact you said no. No images. I want no images of me. But you came humbly as a word. And those of us who are in the business of proclaiming your word, I pray pray for protection that we would represent who you are and, and never become arrogant and proud and overconfident, but that we would be humble also in expressing what you have taught us. Um, I thank you for Dr. Paul Brand, who who transformed so much of my my behavior, my thinking, my life, my way of viewing the world. And he just stands out in a culture like ours, which is so flighty and so shallow in many ways. You look at the Grammy Awards, you look at the Oscar Awards, and it, it, our celebrity culture must be so offensive and sad to you, because I, I think that's not what you had in mind. You, you you showed us what you had in mind, caring for the least of these, our brothers. And Dr. Brand represents that as well as anybody I've ever seen. And I pray for the pastors and writers and others who are listening to this podcast, that we would be countercultural in the best sense of the word, uh, showing the word, showing the world around us a different way, not heroes who have these lavish, extravagant lifestyles, but heroes who 
devote themselves to spreading your compassion and your love for the least of these. That's what we're called to do. And it's so difficult in a in a prosperous society like the United States. It's easy not to wake up every day with a sense of gratitude, but a sense of entitlement, a sense of uh, of selfishness. We're called to present a different way, and I pray that we would do that. And and I pray that that you would lead those who are listening to this broadcast to, to people who who are true heroes, people like Dr. Paul Brand and his wife Margaret. These are the people that give you pride, that please you, and I, I pray that you would help us to find those so that we can point to them and, and say, this is what God had in mind with the human race. These are the people that you can model, model yourself after. You've, you've done that in the Bible. And I pray that you would help us to continue to find people who can demonstrate those qualities in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. That uh, means a lot to me. And I, again, I can't recommend the book highly enough, Fearfully and Wonderfully, The Marvel of Bearing God's Image. Um, I think it'll bless you as much as it did me and be an encouragement. And Philip, it's uh, really a privilege to have you on the podcast today. Just wanted to say thanks again. And if people want to be able to keep up with your writing or pick up a copy of the book, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, I have a website. It's called philipyancy.com. And so you have a last um, name, you have a last name people can spell so that URL works out for you. So, right. <laughs> Y-A-N-C-E-Y. Some people forget that E. And, and I also use Facebook. That's about all I do. I don't Instagram, I don't Twitter or Snapchat, but I do have that Facebook site. So if people want to keep on in touch with me, that would be the place. Yeah. Well, thanks for, um, for all the hard work, all the books, um, all the questions you've been asking. I know they've had an impact on me and so many others and uh, I'll have links in the show notes. And once again, just want to say thanks for the conversation today. Great. Bless you, Chase. Keep doing what you're doing. As always, you can find show notes for today's episode by going to pastorwriter.com slash 95. There you'll find information about Philip Yancey's new book, as well as some of his others, and a link to his website. I also wanted to say thanks for those who have taken the time to leave a review and also to subscribe to the show. Um, if you've been listening to the show for a while and haven't done that, it would really mean a lot to me. The, the reviews help me continue to improve the podcast, and the uh, subscriptions make sure not only that you get the latest episodes, but also that new subscribers new listeners find the show in iTunes or wherever they're listening to podcasts. As always, thanks for listening. Until next time.